the way we use it in Swarm. And uh, it's actually very interesting that two and a half years ago, uh, I gave a talk in the same t-shirt in the same city of Berlin about similar stuff, but back then it was only paperware and somewhat informed speculation. And now I'm actually describing something that we have built. And the differences between the two talks are, to some extent, surprisingly small. So many of the uh, assumptions that we had when we began working on this turned out to be correct, but not all of them. So we have learned a few things along the way that turned out to be different as than we expected. Uh, so first, uh, even though Aaron has already talked quite a bit about it, uh, let's just recap what a DHT is. So DHT, distributed hash table, is a way of storing information based on its uh, based on a key, which in our case is the hash. And the main point here is that the node address space and the data keys are from they come from the same space. So node addresses and uh, and data keys they look the same. They, they they come from the same address space. And there's a defined distance measure on this space. Again, different DHTs use different distance measures. The one that we use is just XORing to addresses and treating the result as a integer number. That's our address uh, that's our business measure. And uh, so this squiggle up here is an illustration where the black dots are nodes, node addresses, and the black circle is sort of the entire address space of the data that we have. And the way this the way data is distributed in any DHT is that the, the more data there is, the smaller the radius uh, which uh, each node holds. So the, the, because of the caching that Aaron has already described, you get all sorts of data, but you get data that are close to you more frequently, and when your storage is about to get full, then you garbage collect the data that is farthest away from you. So when the system is uh, uh, functioning normally, you have these green circles, which are the radius of the data around you, and because they overlap multiple times, you have a healthy healthy amount of redundancy. However, when the storage capacity, when we're starting to reach storage capacity, the radius starts shrinking, and we have sort of a graceful degradation that first we start losing redundancy, and then at some point we will have gaps of the data space which is not going to recover. So it's not that we, we get a catastrophic failure, it's that we will first start noticing a uh, redundancy that is uh, <coughs> decreasing, and then if we leave things that way without adding extra capacity, only then we will start seeing actual data loss. And that's, that's pretty much true for, for every DHD, it's not specific to this one. Uh, another thing that we want is uh, for this network to be self-organized. Uh, so unlike, for example, criminal whatnots, we do not have a command and control center, which means that whatever we do, we, we can only rely on local knowledge. So each node has some information and it can query information from its neighbors, but there are no dedicated nodes with, uh, with global knowledge uh, of the way. Uh, so one thing is how you build, uh, like how you attach to a network. Uh, in general, there are three ways of doing that in a self-organizing fashion. So either you do it completely randomly, if you have a large enough network which is comparable to the entire internet address space, like in case of BitTorrent, one thing that you could do is you should generate random network addresses, try to attach to them, and if you succeed, you succeed, if you don't, you don't. That's the completely random attachment. Preferential attachment is that you somehow 
distinguish between nodes, some you like more, and you try to you try to attach to nodes in such a way that it's more beneficial to you. And there's bootstrap attachment that when you have some bootstrap nodes, for example, maintained by Ethereum Foundation or whatever, and then you first connect to them, and then you build up from that. And uh, then, once you are attached to the network, you, 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 you need to you, you connect to other peers, which are called introductions, so you get other peer information from the, uh, from the node to which you are first attached. And there are, again, two ways of doing that, essentially. One is uh, called a random walk, when you simply ask peers about peers that they already have, and you attach to those. And the other is sort of a guided tour where you, you have some desired network topology in mind and you do the introductions in a specific way so that you actually get that desired, uh, that desired uh, topology. Uh, so scale-free structure, there's a lot to be said about scale-free networks. They are very, very common in nature. Because, precisely because that's how you get them. So if you just attach either randomly or preferentially, and then you, in an ad hoc fashion, ask around to whom you can connect, and then you connect to those, which is, for example, typical to how social um, interactions form. So social graphs have this structure. Uh, air traffic has the same structure between airports. In biology, there are all these protein links that also are scale-free. So scale-free structures are very, very common in nature. And the reason they are called scale-free is because from local knowledge, you cannot tell the size of the entire network. So it's all self-similar. It has this kind of self-similar structure. Uh, and it has some desirable properties, which we will discuss later. And they are good for some things. Unfortunately, for our purposes, they are less than optimal. So, what are the desirable network properties? We want the network to be scalable, and let's denote the number of nodes that we have by n, and we assume this n to be able to grow indefinitely. So, one of the things that we want is a low diameter. The diameter is the, of the network is the longest longest path, uh, the longest shortest path. So it's it's uh, the longest number of links through which you can reach any node. That's, that's basically the diameter. And of course the theoretical minimum of the diameter is a constant. So for example, if everybody is connected to everybody, the diameter of the number is one. You can reach everybody at one point. Uh, in a scale-free outcome, so if you just let the network grow in a scale-free fashion, then your diameter will be the logarithm over the logarithm of the logarithm. So it's some logarithmic, which is pretty cool. It means that your, your, the degree, the average, the, so the, the, the length of the path, sorry, the length of, of the paths are actually closed, but it's shorter than the logarithm of the size of the network, which means that you can reach any node pretty fast, even if you don't pay any attention to how we organize the network. So this is this famous six degrees of separation, which, thanks to Facebook, has shrunk to four, I believe. Uh, but the acceptable maximum is actually more than that, so we're probably fine. Then the other desirable uh, feature is the limited degree of nodes. So you don't want to maintain a ever-growing very large number of connections. You want that, you want the maximum number of connections of each node to be limited. And again, the theoretical minimum that we have, even for scalable networks, is a constant. Actually, that constant happens to be three. So if you have a three regular graph, you can already achieve, you can already achieve uh, a logarithmic diameter. And the acceptable maximum for the degree of nodes is the order of n, so it's somewhat proportional to the network size, 
but it's up to, only up to a while. So this becomes too much. After a while, we can we, we cannot afford to have all of the nodes have a degree proportional to them. Uh, we do have large computers, so the degrees can be quite large, especially if we don't. Talking about the degree in the calculated sense, so how many how many edges you have, how many connections? Yeah, how many connections one node has. So that. Uh, <coughs> So I will, I will talk about that a bit later because it's a tricky question. And uh, then there's another desirable property which is uh, somewhat, uh, so it's, it's difficult to, uh, to express. So there's a property called centrality which people often confuse with the number of degrees, but it's not quite that. So centrality of the node is, uh, so there's a uh, formal definition of centrality, which is the number of the shortest paths that pass through that specific node. Uh, but what it really means is that how important that node is, what part, what part it plays in the connectivity of the network. If, there are, if the centrality is not uniform, if not all nodes are equally central, it means that by removing the more central nodes from the network, we can do disproportional damage. And actually, that is the case with scale-free networks. So scale-free networks naturally develop hubs, nodes that are much more popular than others. And even if their degree is low, they are very crucial to the network. Uh, and this is, it's, it's undesirable in some cases, especially in case of networks like Swarm, to have central nodes because if we get it, so scale-free networks are very, very resilient to random losses of nodes. So randomly leaving nodes will not, will not uh, cause irreparable damage. However, if there's a uh, coordinated attack on the network, which, in, where the, uh, where the adversary is actually knows the network structure and they find the central nodes and they only attack those, then the, net, the cost of attacking the network can go, go low very dramatically if the centrality is not uniform. So we do want to keep the centrality of the network uniform and we also want the housekeeping cost overhead to be uh, fairly low. So you, we want routing to be easy, we want, the, uh, we want the reorganization algorithm to be easy and so on. The ad hoc strategies don't work. Because in the beginning, when you have a ad hoc graph, you have a almost complete graph, so everybody knows everybody. The number of neighbors that you have is somewhat proportional to the network size. Your diameter is really short, and it's not growing for a while and you have somewhat uniform centrality, so in the beginning everything looks nice, but as the network keeps growing, uh, meaning that the, uh, the capacities of individual nodes to connect to every other node are exhausted, uh, then we will get to a scale-free graph, which might be okay. However, the degree of each node will follow the so-called power law, so it will be 1 over x to a power greater than, strictly greater than 1. So it will be, so things like that are typically the, for example, the population numbers of human settlements. So you will have multi-million cities and uh, villages with a few dozen inhabitants. So you will have a great discrepancy in the uh, degree of the nodes, which is undesirable. You will have a very short diameter, which is good, and uh, we will have a centrality measure, which also follows the power law, just just like the just like the uh, degree of the nodes. Uh, so again, to be the advocate of the devil, for example, we use this structure for Ethereum network, and also we use this structure for a Whisper network, because for broadcasts. This, this is actually measurably better. 
So two and a half years ago, I advocated Cadamlia for use in Ethereum network as well, not only in Swarm. And there have been several uh, trials, both simulations and actual trials with computers. And it turned out that this uh, ad hoc network very significantly outperforms Cadamlia because for broadcasts, because the shorter diameter actually matters. And also the housekeeping costs, as long as you don't need routing, so you don't need to, you don't need to be able to find nodes, you don't, because you want to flood the network with messages, you want broadcasts. In those cases, these scale-free networks are not only just fine, they are, they are actually better than Redundia's, but with, uh, with Swarm, where we do want to have routing, this kind of doesn't cut. And then there's not another, another network which looks attractive in the, at first sight, which, are, which I call the quasi-hierarchies, which is a hierarchical structure with some extra links out of there, here and there. So, for ex so here's this example. This is a three regular graph. You can see that every node has exactly three neighbors, and it can grow indefinitely. It will retain a logarithmic diameter, and yet the, the degree will remain three. Now, in practice, these quasi-hierarchies are a little messier, so this is a very deep structure that has been artificially constructed, but there are self-organizing hierarchical algorithms that will build these hierarchical structures. Uh, historically, this is one of the oldest forms of uh, scalable social organizations. So when our ancestors first started to move to groups that are larger than the Dunbar number, this is what they did. So when they had to have large armies or they wanted to till large fields during the agriculture revolution, this is the social structure of choice. Uh, it has some very attractive properties. So it has a constant number of uh, neighbors. It has a logarithmic diameter. It has very low housekeeping overhead. So basically when two, two units from the same army meet, they will work out subordination very quickly so they can join together very fast. The problem is the very highly variable centrality. So these networks are even more vulnerable than the scale free networks. Basically, if you shoot out a few nodes from here, you can splinter the graph into many tiny un unconnected pieces. And uh, therefore, you will have very important nodes that need to be protected much more than all the other nodes. Yeah how the Cadamlia network is organized. Here are the main uh, properties that we're interested in. So we have a logarithmic number of neighbors, which means that Cadamlias are not scale-free. So if you look at a single node of Cadamlia, then you can actually tell up to an order of magnitude how large the whole network is. So every single node has a idea about the size of the network, just because of the number of neighbors keeps growing in a logarithmic fashion. It has a logarithmic diameter, which is acceptable. It is slightly larger than in case of the scale-free graphs. It's sort of the same as in the case of hierarchies, and therefore the message passing times are acceptable. It has a low housekeeping overhead. It has very uniform centrality, and also the BitTorrent network has proven in practice that it scales really well. So this illustration is a special case of Cadamlia, which is the hypercube. Uh, the hypercube happens to be a very regular special case of Cadamlia, and it sort of illustrates the idea that you have, so this is a four-dimensional hypercube with eight nodes, each of them having four lengths, and uh, you can see that the diameter of this graph is three, so in three hops you can, you can reach any, any, any node. Uh, and uh, just as Aaron said, we are using the, so this is the routing table, which uh, Aaron has already described. Uh, I want to, so what we do is, uh, so we use this table not only for routing, but also for introductions. So whenever a node wants to connect to other nodes, it can query one row that is closest to itself to, to another.
other node, and, uh, and this is how we maintain it. So I basically described everything important about it. And uh, joining the network also requires only one bootstrap node, so you only need to know one node from the Kadamlia. It doesn't matter which one. So first you build this link with the bootstrap node, then you do a self-lookup in order to get in order to get this half of the links. So you 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 get to know the, the, the ones that are close to you. And then you look up a random address in the other half in order to to attach to those to those nodes. And with these two lookups you have already joined the Cadamlia, you have roughly the same centrality as everybody else. And from that point on, after these two lookups, you are no longer a special node, you're well connected to, to Cadamlia. Uh, and again, this uh, referring back to our presentation, that uh, we have uh, we have in two different kinds of Kadamlia. The classic Kadamlia does not maintain uh, local uh, connections, and for each for each lookup, you basically find the node which has the information that you need, and then you talk to this node directly. Uh, and then we have uh, our kind of Kadamlia, which is the forwarded Kadamlia, where you have long-lasting relationships and you only talk to your peers and information is forwarded. Uh, there are benefits to both. So, for example, one of the disadvantages of what we do is for each information request, the information needs to pass through a logarithmic number of links rather than passing only through only one direct link. Uh, which means that the network capacity and the bandwidth capacity of our network is slightly worse than in case of the uh, traditional academia. However, we decided back then uh, that this, we can live with that because the other benefits are huge. Uh, so first of all, Today, the internet is not what it used to be. So connecting to another node is quite a bit of work because you might, both of you may be behind, uh, behind firewalls because you, don't, you, you might not even have globally routed uh, network addresses. So you, have, you are behind a map firewall, a network address translation firewall. And it takes quite a bit of resources to pierce those firewalls. <laughs> Uh, also, UDP packet forwarding is restricted very often, so even if you have a globally routed address, you might not receive UDP packets unless you have sent the UDP to that same address first. So there are all sorts of restrictions, and therefore building up a, a network connection is costly, and you really want to do it once and use it and reuse it many times. And, uh, just as Aaron noticed, you have the discipline of uh, repeated dealings, which means that you can actually punish nodes by not behaving, by kicking them out of the network. Uh, also, you can use all sorts of things like establish, uh, establish the encryption keys, uh, payment channels, and so on. So you can actually use the fact that you, 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 need to, you, you can afford to have a higher overhead of building up a connection, and then you can use that connection, and the cost of it is that the amount of information that you need to pass through the network is grown by a logarithmic, uh, <coughs> by a logarithmic uh, factor. But it has a very natural, natural uh, definition under and, and, and this kind of, of forwarding structure. Second one that I don't know if you were talk about it or, or Aaron did is the is the auto scaling property in, in, in case of retrieval. So in, in, in the case of retrieval, when, when the chunk data is passed, actually. Right. That's that's so, my next and uh, last slide. After which I will. So first of all, we use that P2P from Ethereum, which gives us a uh, encrypted uh, and. Uh, encrypted and authenticated secure communication channel for all the all the long-term connections. We forward data, we use four kilobyte chunks, 
we have an encrypted wire protocol, and this is, I think, what Victor was talking about, that this makes Swarm its own content delivery network. So because of the caching, if a chunk is being is, is, is getting popular, many people are requesting the same chunk, the same content, then this content will spread wider than other content, so you will have cached copies of it, not only in the most proximate uh, click, but also outside of it fairly often, which means that most of the retrieval requests will be uh, found much further from the actual address because of this case.